going to give, God willing, I'm going to speak on the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. We live in difficult times. It does not take a great prophet to conclude that. You know it and I know it. These are difficult times. You don't think so. Just watch the evening news and you'll be convinced. If you don't think a, an age in history that can murder tens of millions of babies through abortion, that can begin to kill its old people through euthanasia, a generation whose young people now commit suicide at an unprecedented rate, you know that's the number one cause of death among young people now? No longer car accidents in the Western world. Suicide has exceeded that. The number one cause of death among our young people. Now, if everything's all right, why are our young people, with everything to live for, killing themselves and each other at an unprecedented rate? Everything isn't all right. You know, in the Old Testament, you know who said, all is well, the false prophets were always saying everything is fine and dandy. Don't worry, all is well. I remember in the last 10, 15 years, just a couple of things. We did a study on the state of seminaries in this country, and the conclusion was everything's just great. And I was running into seminarians who didn't even know the doctrine of the faith. Everything was not all right. And then we had a study on the state of religious education. And the conclusion of the study, all is well. All is well. We're doing a good job. Pat each other on the head. Meanwhile, after 12 years of religious education, many of our children didn't even know the Ten Commandments, the Seven Sacraments didn't know how to pray, and didn't want to. Something is wrong. And we were congratulating each other on how well we've done. Wake-up time. Reality check. 75% of Catholics supposedly don't even go to church on Sunday. And going to church on Sunday is just a bare-bones beginning. Practicing your faith. Oh, it's good. Very good. But don't think it's enough. As one of my Baptist preacher friends would say, well, we put our Christian hat on, on Sunday, take it off on Monday. Live like Christians on Sunday, live like hell on Monday. He knows what he's talking about. Very often that's the case. I'm going to give a very brief synthesis on interpretation of sacred scripture. Now, we all know the Bible is important the Word of God. We should reverence the Word of God. The first thing I have to say about the Word of God, here's how you begin. If you want to learn about the Word of God, the Word of God is not something. The Word of God is somebody, and his name is Jesus Christ. Now start right there. You're not studying some kind of abstraction. It's hard to love an abstraction. It's hard to learn mere abstractions. Most of all, it's hard to live an abstraction. The Word of God is not a mere something. The Word of God, the eternal Word, is Jesus Christ, the Father's only Word. In the eternal silences of the Trinity, God our Father spoke but one word, his eternal word, and he has no more to say. For in Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, everything is summarized, all of being, all of history. And so the focal point of sacred scripture is Jesus Christ, and that includes the Old Testament. And that's why in a Catholic seminary or university, it's nonsensical to have someone other than an authentic Catholic scholar teach Old Testament. 
I don't care how fluent you are in Hebrew or Aramaic, if you don't understand where it ended up, meaning the New Testament, you really can't teach it. We teach the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. And we teach the New Testament in light of the Old. The Word of God is one. There isn't some kind of false dichotomy between Old Testament and New Testament. Sometimes you hear it said, Oh, the Old Testament was about judgment and vengeance, and the New Testament was about love, as though God could be divided. No, that's an error. And the church has pointed out that's an error in thinking, an error in scholarship. The Word of God is one. Jesus is that word. We need to talk about divine revelation. You've heard that term. Now, we're not talking about private revelation. We are not, not talking about the Holy Spirit giving you some personal revelation. That can happen. But we're talking about public revelation, divine revelation. I'm, I try to give these things simply. God, by definition, is pure simplicity. And so we shouldn't try to overly complicate something that's purely simple. The problem is the God who is pure simplicity doesn't appear that way to us because we have a finite mind, and it's hard for us to grasp all of God all at once. Not only hard, impossible. That which is finite can't encompass the infinite. We grope, we try, we labor. Divine revelation is nothing more than God our Father revealing himself to us in the person of his word, Jesus Christ. That's divine revelation. Now that revelation comes to us, is transmitted to us in two essential ways. When Jesus entered time and space, the eternal word, now the person is divine. Jesus is a divine person. That's a matter of faith. He is a divine person, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. The subject of action is God and the Son of God. When he assumed a human nature in the fullness of time, as the letter to the Galatians says, in the fullness of time God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law to deliver from the law those who were subject to it. The Incarnation. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us. Now, when Jesus walked in Palestine, when he talked and healed and delivered from the grip of the devil, Jesus did not write a book. Now, be sure the Bible, the written word of God, has God as its primary author. It's not a mere human invention. The primary author of sacred scripture certainly is God. But when Jesus taught, he taught orally. He did not sit down and write a book. And so we have the oral teaching of Jesus Christ, which preceded the written teaching. Jesus taught primarily his apostles, his inner core. Those 12 men he called. He didn't call them because they were smarter than anybody else. And he didn't call them because they were holier than anybody else. He called them because possibly they weren't as smart as many. They weren't nobly born, they weren't wealthy, weren't good-looking, they were smelly old fishermen. Now, you and I probably could have done better than that. I often think about that. You know, sometimes people say, oh, well, priests, you know, well, why couldn't women be priests, or this, or that, or the other argument? Well, it's a simple answer for it. God's not prejudiced. Jesus Christ is not a bigot. He's just smarter than you and I. Why did he choose 12 men? Because they're better than women? No. Probably most of the women were smarter than them, more holy than them, better looking than them. Why did he call those 12? Because no one would be confused at who was doing the work. God Almighty, working through the weak, useless, to do a great work. I often think, the other day I was talking to my superior, the founder of our order, and I said, gee, Father Jim, I, you know, our ministry is growing by leaps and bounds. We are reaching hundreds of thousands of people. 20, 30,000 and more tapes a month go out. 
on television and radio. We're reaching all over the world. It just boggles my mind. And it kind of disturbs me. Why on earth would God call me? He said, it's simple. Couldn't find anybody worse. <laughs> kind of sums it up. Jesus doesn't call people because they're better than other people. He didn't call 12 men because men are better than women. Just the opposite, probably. When we find out in heaven, we're going to find out. I'll tell you my experience. A lot more women are more spiritual than men. Now, nothing against men. But a lot more women take their faith seriously than men do. Now, I don't know what that is. It's in their nature, I think. I think women don't have, you know, this macho thing. I think men sometimes are afraid to be too religious, you know. Well, let me tell you something. The crisis in the world is partly because men feel that way. Let me tell you the most macho man that ever lived. The toughest guy who ever lived. The greatest hero who ever lived is right there. He's on a cross. His name is Jesus Christ. There wasn't anybody greater than that. That's a real man. A real man. And so, men would do well to follow him. But in any event, God called that twelve. Now, Jesus taught. What did Jesus teach? In biology, the teacher teaches something, a science, separate from himself. He teaches biology. He studied it, and he passes it on. Jesus is the only case of a teacher who perfectly and absolutely taught himself. What did Jesus teach? He taught the truth. Jesus is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so, for anyone who would teach the faith, you must become one with Jesus Christ. To the degree you are one with Jesus, you will have the power to teach, to transmit the faith. If it is just an abstraction or a science to you, you will remain an amateur. To the degree we become one with Christ, then we can teach. It's not merely a question of intellectual prowess, of how sharp our mind is, that helps. How good our memory is, that helps. Faith is more important than all the science in the world. But the science can help us to expound our faith. In order to reveal himself to us, God our Father sent his Son. His Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And so when we look at Jesus, we see the Father's glory. He is the exact representation of our Heavenly Father. The Word of God, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, truth, everything beautiful, good, life itself. That Word came to us then in that spoken way. Jesus taught orally. Now that was given to his apostles who handed it on to their successors in what we call apostolic succession, the bishops. The successors of the apostles are the bishops in union with the bishop of Rome. That's called the hierarchy. That's called the teaching office of the church. The bishops in union with the bishop of Rome, the pope. Now you and I are temples of the Holy Spirit. You and I don't have a guarantee of the Holy Spirit. The magisterium of the church has a guarantee of the Holy Spirit when it teaches definitively in faith and morals. You don't. Neither do I. But you might say, but we are church. Yeah, we are. We are church. Are you baptized? Yes. Then, yes, you are church. That's true. But I will add this. We are church to the degree we accept church teaching and live the church's authentic life of holiness. And we are not church to the degree we reject church teaching and reject the church's life of holiness. Don't say you filled with the Holy Spirit and start knocking the Pope. That spirit you got's not holy. That's another one. And so be real careful about which spirit you're messing with. The Spirit of God leads us to humility, which capacitates us to obey. Obey the authentic and authoritative teaching of the church, which came to us, first of all, in an oral form. That's called sacred tradition. 
capital P, not mere custom. Sacred tradition is the apostolic kerygma. That is the oral teaching of Jesus Christ and the apostles who transmitted faithfully what he said in essential matters of faith and morals. Secondly, some of that, some of that oral teaching was written down. That's the Bible, the New Testament. Some of what Jesus said, I said some of what he said and did was written down. You don't believe it? Read the last paragraph of the Gospel of John. I doubt that the world could contain all of the books it would take to record what Jesus said and did. So we've got one word of God transmitted to us in a spoken form, sacred tradition, and a written form, sacred scripture. Now, whenever you have a word, written or spoken, you've got to have some authoritative and authentic interpreter of that word. Because if you don't, what you're going to end up with is about as many opinions as you have people looking at that word, listening to that word, reading that word. That's the magisterium of the church. When I preach, one message is coming out of my mouth. Okay, I'm delivering a message. Now, if I have a hundred people listening to me or a thousand, that one message is coming to them each in a way which they're able to receive it. In other words, that message is coming through a certain filter. You know, like air passes through a filter, water passes through a filter, gasoline passes through a filter. Well, when I deliver a message, when the Pope delivers a message, when anybody delivers a word, that comes to us through our filter. You've got a thousand people, you've got a thousand different filters. That filter is the sum total of our education, our experience, our predispositions, our biases, and so forth. Now, the problem is most people don't check their filter. And so when that message comes, one person receives it one way and another one receives it another way. It's the same message, but it's interpreted subjectively by the person listening to it. That's why Jesus gave us a church and a teaching office in that church. In the 16th chapter, the Gospel of Matthew, they were passing through the region of Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus said, Who do men say that I am? The first Gallup poll. <laughs> Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. Conflicting and contradictory things about the same thing. Mere personal opinions. They can't all be right. Then he turned to his closest. He said, yes, but what about you? Talking to the apostles. What about you? What do you say? I can imagine a very unearthly silence for a moment. Then one voice rang out. Thou art the Christ, son of the living God. Ah, Simon son of John. No mere man has revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven, and I for my part, and remember who the I is here, it's a divine I. Jesus is talking. The subject of action is divine, divine person. And I for my part declare that you are a rock. Jesus is changing Simon's name to Peter. I for my part declare that you are a rock, and upon this rock I shall build my church. Who's the I? Who's building the church? Jesus Christ is building the church. The subject of action is divine. And for all those scholars who have been educated into imbecility and who claim that Jesus didn't intend to found a church and that it's an invention of man, read the Bible, boys, that are just talking about it. I declare, God Almighty saying, I declare that you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the very gates of hell will not prevail against it. The word rock. Now you will hear all kinds of interpretations of this, but if you look at the Old Testament, 
which Jesus knew inside and out because he knew himself. And the word of God is one. And the Old Testament wasn't something extrinsic to the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God is God, for God and his word are one, for the eternal word is God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word is God. Jesus knew himself inside out. And in the Old Testament, that word rock is used many times, like we would use it, oh, there were some rocks on the ground, and they picked up rocks and stoned them and so forth. But every once in a while, that word is capitalized, and it refers to God, the rock of my salvation. Now, what is Jesus saying? He is not saying Peter's God. Peter is not God. Peter is an old, smelly fisherman who is weak, cowardly, prone to make mistakes, just like you and me. The rock is Christ. The chief cornerstone of the church is Jesus Christ. Make no mistake about that. The chief cornerstone, the rock upon which our faith is built, is not a man, but it is God and Son of God. Jesus is the rock. But what's he saying? He's saying, Simon, I'm going to graft you into myself. You are rock, for you and I are now one, bound together in a mystical marriage. The two have become one flesh, Jesus through his human nature, one with Peter, such that when Peter speaks in matters of faith and morals, it is Christ speaking through him. Whoever hears you, hears me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me and him who sent me. That is the divine institution of the church. And remember who it is who alone recognized Jesus for who he was. Peter. And no man revealed that to him but the heavenly father. At another time later, and this is where translation of scripture is important. You know, every time you translate, you lose something. Even if you mean to do well and you do your best, when you translate from one language to the next, you're apt to lose a little bit. There's an old saying, the translator is a traitor. Not because he means to be, but it's just the differences in language. In the Latin, now the official Bible of the Catholic Church is the Neo Vulgate, the Latin version. Now, there are many acceptable versions. New American Bible, Revised Standard, Catholic Edition, Jerusalem, and so forth. But the official Bible of the Catholic Church is the Neo-Vulgate in Latin. In the Latin, Jesus is saying, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. Remember that? Satan has desired to sift you, and the you in Latin is plural, not singular. You see, there were two words. There are two words in Latin for you, a, a plural and a singular. Satan has desired to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed, he's talking to Peter now, but I have prayed for thee, singular. You want to be included in the prayer for Peter, because if not, you get sifted as wheat. And so what happened? Separate yourself from Peter. What do you have? Two churches, then three, then five. Now almost 40,000 Christian groups sifted as wheat, divided and divided and divided some more. You want to be one with Peter, the one who recognizes Jesus Christ, the one who was given to us by Jesus Christ to be the source of unity in the church because the Holy Spirit is given to Peter and the bishops united to him to interpret the word of God authentically. Whether the written word, the Bible, or that apostolic kerygma, sacred tradition, that word of God, written or spoken, is interpreted authentically and authoritatively by the church. Now, the church doesn't have a specific interpretation of every passage in Scripture. There are very few proof texts meaning where the church comes out and says, this is what it means, and this alone. The Holy Spirit 
is the interpreter of sacred scripture. The church, through her magisterium, is given a guarantee of the Holy Spirit. Now, I have had people come up to me now and then and say, yeah, but I don't accept that Pope's teaching on this or that or the other thing. You know, I, I really don't think he's moving in the spirit. What kind of spirit you got? An arrogant one? A perverse one? There's not a holy one to be talking that way. I'm going to tell you something. This is the kiss of death. If you are afflicted with it, get healed in a hurry. The days for fence sitting or for being on the wrong side of the fence are quickly coming to an end. Because I'm going to tell you, God Almighty is going to reach down, take hold of that fence and shake it. And you're going to end up on the right side or the wrong side. You're going to be for him or against him. Now you all come to the right place. It's called the Catholic Church. Now I am not saying anything against any other religion. Please don't think that. That's not what I'm saying. Everyone has a right to worship God exactly as they feel led to do. I am all for religious freedom. But I got in an argument with a priest one time out in Wyoming. I was talking like I usually do, and he said, Boy, I got the feeling that you want everybody to be Catholic. Our Catholic faith is the fullness of Christianity. Now, that does not mean we look down on anybody. I'll tell you something. An awful lot of Baptists and Pentecostals and others live what they have better than we live what we have. We got more. But to those who have been given much, much will be required. To the man given more, more will be required. And so, if through no fault of theirs, they are born in a certain Christian denomination, and they live it well. Praise the Lord. And the priest said, well, you should just be happy and let them alone. Like heck. I should be happy that they don't have Jesus in the blessed Eucharist? You don't know what you have. I should be happy that they don't know the blessed mother? I can't be happy and I can't rest until they know that joy of having a real, loving, spiritual mother, of having the fullness of divine revelation, of having the consolation of knowing that Jesus didn't leave us, he's still with us, not just in his word, but in his real, true, and substantial presence in the Eucharist, which is not just like any other mode of presence, by the way, in case you've been fed that lie, spit it out. That mode of presence, Jesus in the blessed Eucharist, is the highest mode of present. Mode means way of being present. That's the highest way that Jesus is present. He's in heaven that way, and he's here in the Eucharist that way. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. What's body, blood, and soul speak of? The humanity of Christ. United to his divinity. God's everywhere. Yes, he is. God is everywhere in virtue of his power is gone. But I guarantee you, you will not find me out there under one of those eucalyptus trees prostrate worshiping that tree. I am not a pagan. Oh, but God's everywhere. You won't find me out there doing that, but you will find me before the tabernacle, flat on my face, adoring the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Why? Because he is there in a unique way. And they say, oh, but it's a static presence. A static presence? Let me tell you something. That is the most dynamic presence in the universe. That's God Almighty himself. That's Jesus, the whole Jesus, true God and true man. There's an attack on the Eucharist. All right. So we've got that magisterium of the church. That means the Pope and the bishops united to him. In the same teaching in faith and morals that we have received throughout the ages. That means essential matters of faith and morals. That's the truth. You've got to know where the lines are, my dear friends. You've got to learn your faith. Let me tell you what happens if you don't learn your faith. You run a terrible risk of losing your faith. Because those who are unwary, those who have not moved themselves a little bit, to learn something of their faith. And I'm not talking about just head knowledge. 
We've got to interiorize what we learn and make it part of ourselves. It's more than memorizing, but memorizing can be part of it. Can you imagine a brain surgeon or an engineer or a physicist who says, well, I want to be this or that profession, but I really don't want to memorize. You know, it's that memorization is such a dull thing and it's really below my nature. So I don't want to memorize all of those scientific formulas. I'm going to tell you what, I'm not driving across his bridge. <laughs> and he's not going to perform surgery on me. And yet that's what we think about the faith. You know, for some years now, we tried to catechize without teaching anything. All experience. Oh, after I taught the catechism, we had a lot of people come into the church. We had Hindus, we had Buddhists, we had Jews, we had Protestants of every description coming into the Catholic Church. I remember a story about a Jewish man who came in, went through the RCIA program, and that consisted of sitting around talking about the Bible readings from the lectionary that week. Nothing wrong with that. But they went around in a circle and said, what do you think it means? What do you think it means? What do you think it means? They come to the Jew, and he said, what I think it means, I come here to find out what you think it means. <laughs> and what happens? After that kind of teaching, I'm going to tell you what happens. Nothing happens. You don't know your faith. You can't defend your faith. And the first fast-talking, slippery-tongued liar that comes along, you buy it. You fall right on your face. You know, I was in a meeting with bishops a few years ago down in Central America, and the bishops were bemoaning the fact that five million-plus Catholics had departed in the previous three years and gone over to the Assemblies of God and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and so forth. And I said, you know why that happened? And he said, well, the other guys, they had a lot of money and we didn't have this. Said, well, that might be a contributory effect, but that's not why it happened. Why you guys were sitting on your ecclesiastical butts teaching liberation theology and all the hollow stuff, they at least still believed in the Ten Commandments. And so you can't give people a bunch of hollow drivel which doesn't have the power to save and think you're going to hold them. The reason they left was because they didn't know what they had. Catholics leave because they don't know what they have. If they knew what they had, they'd never leave. If you knew you had Jesus in the Eucharist, if you really knew it, interiorized it and lived it, if you loved our Blessed Mother, if you loved the Holy Father in the fullness of truth which he teaches to his magisterium, you know, you got to say like, like Peter, Lord, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life right here in the Catholic Church. And so, divine revelation. God reveals himself to us in the person of his only word. That's transmitted to us in sacred scripture, sacred tradition, as interpreted by the magisterium of the church. The Holy Spirit is the interpreter of scripture. Now, in order... To read scripture properly, we have to discover the writer, the human author's intention. The reader must take into account the conditions of the time and culture, the literary genres in use at that time, and the modes of feeling, speaking, and narrating then current. In other words, we've got to study all those things to properly interpret sacred scripture, yes. It is a science, yes. But it is not merely a science. Now, I'm going to tell you one of the worst tragedies in the church in recent years. Now that is a good teaching. We must come to the literal meaning intended by the human authors. Remember that there are two authors of scripture. God is the primary author of sacred scripture. God the Holy Spirit. Working through the human authors, those authors recorded what God wanted to say for the sake of our salvation. It's a special gift of the Holy Spirit, inspiration for the writing of Scripture. Now, there is, however, another principle. Because sacred Scripture is inspired, it is no less important for correct interpretation 
that we realize the following. We have to read and interpret sacred scripture in the light of the same spirit who gave it to us in the first place. Now, what does that mean in plain English? It means this. You can take a scripture scholar or any other kind of scholar who's a brilliant man, and boy, a lot of them are, who has studied very much. He, he has great gifts of the intellect. He can memorize. He's got a mind like a steel trap. He is fluent in Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. But if he isn't filled with the same Holy Spirit who inspired the Word in the first place, he remains an amateur and an outsider. This is very important to reduce sacred scripture to a mere empirical science is the kiss of death. So-called educated men stray from the basic principles and arrive at the most absurd conclusions. Jesus didn't know he was God. Tell that to my grandma and see what she would say if she was still alive. Oh, Jesus didn't know he was God. Jesus didn't intend to institute a church. Oh, Jesus doesn't care about morality. God help us on that. There are some principles that are laid down by the Second Vatican Council for properly interpreting sacred scripture. Yes, we have to come to the literal meaning. True. You need to know language for that. You need to know the literary genres. You need to know the customs of the time. Archaeology helps. Those are all good things. And all the other senses of Scripture are derived from that literal sense, which we come to through science. But the scientist had better be a man of God. That scientist better have faith first. That scientist, no matter how brilliant he is, had better be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if he's not, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. Going to be some spirit speaking. If he's not filled with the Holy Spirit, there's going to be another one that takes over. And he is going to go the wrong way. I'll give you an example. I went to a good seminary. We had good teachers. But you know, even in good seminaries and universities, now and then one sneaks in. I tell you, one day I'm sitting in class, and the professor comes out, he's a priest, had a doctorate in sacred scripture. And he says, well, today I am going to explain to you in the light of modern scholarship and archaeological findings what the manna in the desert is. And I looked to my left and right, I had some friends there, and I said, oh, this ought to be good. We're going to learn about the manna in the desert. And we had a little experience with this guy before, so we didn't quite know what was coming. And he began, he said, the manna in the desert, modern science reveals to us archaeological findings, that manna was, a, was ant dung from a species of carpenter ant that inhabited the Judean desert. Can you imagine? And at that point in time, it hit my mind, I wonder what that does for the type of the Eucharist. For well, that's what the manna in the desert is, an Old Testament figure and type of the blessed Eucharist. I started coming up out of my chair like an MX missile. <laughs> these guys are restraining me. Aunt Dung! You give a new meaning to being educated into imbecility. <laughs> that's the results of scholarship? Get serious. Well, that happens. That going on. Now, he didn't make that up. He read it in a book. He learned it in that graduate school he went to. I won't mention the name, but it's in Northern California. <laughs> Hopefully, it's better now than it used to be. I hope. God, please. All right. Three principles laid down by the Second Vatican Council, every bit as important as arriving at the literal sense of Scripture. Number one, we must be especially attentive to the content and unity of the whole of Scripture. Different as the books of the Bible are, Scripture is a unity by reason of the unity of God's plan, of which Christ Jesus is the center and heart that heart opened since his Passover. Now, I'll give you an example. When we read a passage in Scripture, you see where they go wrong very often is they'll take one word 
they'll look at that word under a microscope. Right? They'll study that word up one side and down the other, forgetting the context in which that word is inserted. They will critically analyze that word. German theologians had a lot to do with this. There's a process which is uh, called form geschichte, redaction geschichte. It's a way of critically analyzing a word or passage in the Bible. You know, all this, I, I remember once I heard that, somebody's going on, yes, form geschichte, redaction geschichte. I remember thinking, yeah, you've got too much geschichte in this studying. <laughs> you better get rid of some of that because it, it, it's making your brain slow. Something's going wrong here. Now you take a word out of context, you analyze that word into oblivion, and what happens? You, you end up losing the meaning. So this principle laid down by the Second Vatican Council, and scholars have to follow this just like we do, be especially attentive to the content and unity of the entire Scripture. I'll give you an example. I was down in Florida preaching, and I found out there's a certain Christian preacher down there preaching we got to knock off abortion doctors. We've got to kill them, using the Bible to justify it. Uh -oh, it was going on. And we knew it was a terrible danger. Now, we all admit that abortion's a terrible crime. It's awful. But you can't preach murder. I mean, you can't say we've got to, we have to defend the babies, so we've got to kill the doctors before they can kill the babies. That is unconscionable. But he was preaching that way. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You see, they're evil, and they are trying to get the innocent, so we got to protect the innocent. And just like in a just war, we can knock them off before they do any more damage. Well, you know what happened. I was in Pensacola. You know what happened twice. Two doctors murdered. He took that passage out of context. He didn't read it in the context of all of Scripture, the message of the Lord, his revelation to us. And what happened? Big trouble happened. That's what happened. It wasn't made public, but the bishop down there got a notice from the police. They had received a threat for every single abortion doctor murdered, 10 priests will be murdered. Police said, it's serious. Take it seriously. And we had to use anti-terrorist tactics. We couldn't go the same route back and forth from where we worked and so forth. And well... That's number one. Read it as a totality. You know, not, don't take it out of context. Read it as a totality. Second, read the scripture within the living tradition of the whole church. Now, that's sacred tradition. The teaching of the fathers, doctors, and saints of the church. Where'd they get it from? They got it from the apostles. Who'd they get it from? They got it from Jesus. That apostolic charisma, that sacred tradition, that oral teaching, which has the same weight as sacred scripture. That's what the church teaches. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture have the same weight, for they both speak of the one word of God. One in an oral way, one in a written way, but the same one only word is what we're dealing with. Three, be attentive to the analogy of the faith. The analogy of the faith means the coherence of the truths of the faith among themselves and within the plan of revelation. Those three principles. You can find this all in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, right towards the beginning there in its exposition on divine revelation. Two essential senses of Scripture. The literal sense, and that's what the human authors are trying to convey, what the words mean literally. That's very important. That comes first. Then there's the spiritual sense of Scripture. Now, that has largely been ignored, diminished, distorted, even destroyed today. It is never spoken of, but there is a spiritual sense of sacred scripture. Now, the word of God is just that. The word of God. The word is God. There's no difference between the word of God and God. The word of God is God. God transcends time and space. Now, things in the Bible, many of them, happened at a certain time and in a certain place. Jesus healed the sick. Really, he did. Jesus multiplied the fishes and the loaves. Now, don't believe any of that drivel about somebody saying, well, they really had it with them, you know, and that was the miracle was just to get them to share. 
I want to see you carry around some old fish in the Judean desert for several days. A lot of baloney. Miracles are real. Now, is it a problem for God to perform a miracle? Of course not. These people are rationalists who try to do that. Now, the, the Holy Father's encyclical on rationalism and how it affects the teaching of the faith is very important. They won't admit the supernatural. Like that guy who taught around California quite a while. He had a doctorate degree in religious education. Then he went back east in my home area and taught. Didn't believe in angels. And I remember the elderly lady telling me about it. said, oh, I remember him, Father. I sat in the classes. He was forming, he was teaching all the catechists in the diocese. And he didn't believe in the existence of angels, and it came out in his teaching. And I said, oh, Doctor, uh, could you please tell me something? Do you believe that angels are real? He said, of course not. Angels are mere literary devices used in Scripture to get a point across. An old lady said at that point, she said, I hope one of them their literary devices come down and boots you in the butt. <laughs> wake you up. It's a lot more than a mere literary device. It's real, and it is part of the doctrine of the faith. If you believe it, you have the faith. If you don't, you don't have the faith. Simple as that. The devil, absolutely real. His activity, absolutely real. The existence of purgatory. Oh, it's a part of the doctrine of the faith. But you may say, well, I don't believe in purgatory. Well, brother, whether you believe it or not doesn't change reality one bit. That's part of our faith. Like it or not, believe it or not, I'm going to tell you, if you have any brains, you'll like it a lot. I'll tell you why. Because unless you are pure and perfect, you're not going to stand before God, and not many of us are that pure, and not many of us are that perfect. And so there used to be an old commercial on television that said, you can pay me now, or you can pay me later. You know, you can expiate for your sins now and hope you get it all covered. Or, thanks be to God, if you die without mortal sin on your soul, there is a place of final purification. Is that bad? No, that's very good. That's the mercy of God. That's purgatory. We believe it. You have to believe it. Don't play fast and loose with the truth. It's the only thing that can set you free. And so, we've got this spiritual sense of sacred scripture. Divided into three subsections. Now, don't worry about big words. God's not going to give you a quiz when you go to heaven to see if you can get in. But I'll tell you, knowing some of this can help you to live your life. But just know the principle. The allegorical sense, that's where we acquire a more profound understanding of events by recognizing their significance in Christ. I'll give you an example. Catechism gives the example. The crossing of the Red Sea, an actual event in the Old Testament. Once again, don't believe the drivel that says, oh, it didn't really happen. Yeah, that, that happened. That happened. As though God couldn't part the sea. The one who made it in the first place has some problem parting the sea. You know, God's all-powerful. He can do anything he wants to. Okay, that is a type, a prefigurement of Christ's victory and also Christian baptism. Now, you remember... The rock at Meribah, right? The people were complaining against Moses and against God. We don't have any water. We're 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 going to we're, we're not we're going to die because we we just are dying of thirst. No water. And so Moses prayed to God, good mediator that he was. And God said to Moses, "Take the staff with which you parted the waters of the Red Sea." Now you see how all these things are tied together. If somebody just made that up, or if that's just some kind of device used in the literature of the Bible, there's something wrong because God's going along with it real well. And he's telling Moses, take that staff with which you parted the waters of the Red Sea and strike the rock, the rock at Meribah. And what happened? Water flowed from the rock. Now that, in an allegorical sense, points to something that would happen. The rock is Christ. Struck with the wood of the cross, he gives forth the life-giving waters of the Holy Spirit, which well up unto eternal life. You see, that's what it means. That's what it points to. That's the allegorical meaning of sacred scripture. 
and is relevant right here and right now. Yes, it was historical. It did happen at a certain place in a certain time. But the Word of God, because it is the Word of God, transcends all time and all place, hence is relevant at every time and in any place. And that means right here, right now, that Al Gore is relevant to me. I'm dying of thirst. I am dying of thirst spiritually. I look around the world and I'm discouraged. I even look around the church. I can't get fed. I don't have anybody to teach me my faith. I'm dying of thirst. That staff is the cross. Embrace it. That strikes the rock who is Christ, who hasn't left us orphaned. He promised he wouldn't. The life-giving waters of the Holy Spirit come forth. And the Holy Spirit will lead you. He will lead you and teach you. He'll bring you to each other. He'll bring you to EWTN. And I don't care who doesn't like it. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will give you what you need if you are sincere about your faith, if you are humbly obedient to the Holy Father and his teaching, if you don't play fast and loose with morals. And by the way, that's a very key principle. Only the pure, the single-hearted can see God. Don't think you're going to see the truths of the faith if you're living in mortal sin. Now, God loves you, even though you're living in mortal sin. Be sure of that. God loves every sinner. I was dead in mortal sin 20 years of my life. I'm not proud of it, but I'll tell you this. God loved me even then, but he did not love the sin that was eating me alive. You are my beloved brother or sister. You contract cancer. I don't stop loving you because of the disease. Perhaps I love you even more. If I have the heart of Christ, I desire to alleviate your suffering. Maybe even I'll take it on myself to liberate you from that pain. The cancer is sin. God loves the sinner. He hates the sin. Why? Because the sin is eating his child alive. And so let's be clear, very clear on these things. And so there's a moral sense the events reported in Scripture ought to lead us to act justly, rightly, morally. As St. Paul says, this was written for our instruction, for the sake of our salvation, the moral sense, and then the anagogical sense. We can view realities and, and events in terms of their eternal significance, leading us toward our true homeland. Thus, the church on earth is a sign of the heavenly Jerusalem. My brothers and sisters, this is a very rough overview for what's coming. I just wanted to give you some of these basic principles. Now the rest of the day I'm going to talk about this spiritual sense of sacred scripture as it applies to the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, or as it used to be called, the Apocalypse. Apocalypse Now. <laughs> God's blessing. This is At the end, forever, you and I will be in heaven or hell, period. The book of Revelation, or the apocalypse as it is sometimes known, the last book of the Bible, and perhaps the, the least read, although I would have to say in these days, um, as we're approaching a new millennium, I don't know, maybe it's one of the most frequently read books of the Bible, but it's difficult. It's very, very difficult to read the book of Revelation with any understanding. It's what we call apocalyptic literature. Now, every kind of the different kinds of literature in the Bible, they have to be read as, as, as they were written. You know, you have to know something about it. There's a lot of symbolism in apocalyptic literature. It doesn't mean that you take absolutely literally uh, the symbolism, but that symbolism is meant to convey to us a reality that's important. An example, you know, a, a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. Well, 
that seems to be odd to us. You know, a lamb with it. Well, of course, it, it, the lamb refers to Jesus. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, the horns, the universal power, seven, the number of perfection, the omniscience of God, all seeing, knows all things, sees all things. So there's a lot of symbolism in apocalyptic literature. Uh, there's a lot of allegory in apocalyptic literature. Now, don't let any of that throw you. It's still relevant. Remember this. The most real reality is spiritual reality. And in a rationalistic age, it's easy for us to forget that. At a time in history when most educated people want to see it under a microscope, want it demonstrated empirically, it's very difficult for us to deal with this kind of spiritual reality. If we can't see it, hear it, touch it, taste it, well, maybe we won't believe it. Well, then you won't believe in God. You know, because God's pure spirit, after all. Uh, how do you know he exists? Well, he's revealed it to us. How do you know what he's like? Well, he's revealed that too. So this book of Revelation, it's not easy, but it is relevant. Now, it is relevant to every time in history. And it is especially relevant to us. Right here, right now, in the latter 20th century, in the United States of America. This is the revelation God gave to Jesus Christ that he might show his servants, you and me, what must happen very soon. Very soon. Well, remember, with God, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. So very soon uh, can be thousands of years. That's not much in the context of eternity. Now, those who will say, oh, well, St. Paul uh, or St. John, they, they thought the end was near, and, and they were talking this way, uh, do this, or before the end, and the end is near, and this and this, and live as though, husbands live as though they don't have wives, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and they were deceived. See, they thought it was coming, and it didn't. No, nonsense. St. Paul and St. John and all the apostles, the evangelists, and other sacred writers, they were in touch with reality. I can make the same statement they made. Repent and believe in the gospel, for the end is near. I'm not talking about the end of the world here. I'm talking about your end and mine. How long do you think you're going to live? Not much longer. 10 years, 20 years, 50, 100, that's nothing. In the context of eternity, 10 billion years is less than a second in the context of eternity. And so, yes, eschatologically, for you personally, and that's the only thing that really matters for you and for me, when we stand before God, that is the end in a manner of speaking. Nobody knows the end of the world. Nobody knows when that is. Look, all this stuff is compounding as we approach the year 2000, right? All this apocalyptic talk, you know, don't get carried away with it. Nobody knows. The angels don't know when the end of the world is going to come. God alone knows that. Don't worry about it. Just don't worry. My mother has a little cartoon in her kitchen on a cupboard. It's a picture of a director's chair. On the back of it, it says God. And down here, there's the world, the earth. And it says, don't worry. He's in charge. Well, don't worry. He is in charge. But... You look around the world, and it is worrisome. You look at all these signs, and there are signs. And don't think they're meaningless. Those who have eyes, let them see. Those who have ears, let them hear. It does not take 
a nuclear physicist or a prophet to realize something dramatic is imminent. You look around at the state of the world and you see hundreds of millions of abortions have taken place in the last three decades or so. Is that insignificant? Not if you know anything about God. All of the impurity, the violence, that's significant. Moral evil precedes all evil. The moral unraveling of a world, a country, a family, a person, precedes the general unraveling of that person, whether it's physical or emotional. Moral evil precedes it all. We've got a lot of moral evil. And so it doesn't take Jeremiah or Elijah to come back and say something's going to happen. Something's happening already. To the seven churches of the province of Asia, now this revelation, this book of Revelation, the fathers and doctors, saints of the church, almost all of them thought that it's St. John the Apostle who'd been exiled to the island of Patmos for his fidelity to the faith, who has this revelation. There is no good reason to think other than that. Although today a lot of scholars say, oh, well, we're not sure. We're not sure if it was St. John the Apostle or not because of the, the literary style and so forth. I would not want to take a position against the vast majority of fathers, doctors, and saints of the church who had much more of the Holy Spirit than any upstart scholar, no matter how smart he may be, and no matter how contemporary his methods may be. St. John the Apostle, that's who's involved here. That's most likely the author of the book of Revelation. So he has a mystical experience, an ecstasy, and God reveals something to him. Now, what that stands for symbolically is important. The literal meaning of this text is important. It is. The number seven, we know, is the number of perfection, and it's used repeatedly. You know, it speaks of the lampstands, the seven lampstands that refer to the churches. That's important to know that. All of the symbolism is important, but you can become so wrapped up with the, with the literal meaning that you lose the more importantly, in a way, spiritual meaning. When I say more importantly, I mean for you and for me. If you just get mired down in empirical science, which is good, and necessary, but if that's all you have, it becomes a dead letter. The Bible becomes a dead book, just a book like any other book. But it's not a book like any other book. It's God's holy word. And it is relevant for you and for me. It is relevant at every time and in every place. And so the Holy Spirit draws out meaning. The Holy Spirit teaches us, especially now, and that's the way I'm going to try to present this. I know a lot of people in the church. I know a lot of holy people in the church. I know a lot of saintly bishops, priests, religious sisters, and holy lay people. I've talked with hundreds of them. I know what they're sensing now. We have one Holy Spirit, and he seems to be working in the same way in hearts and minds all over the world. To the seven churches in the province of Asia, seven, the number of perfect, perfection. I could say to the church, to the church of all times in all places, to the church in the United States of America, right here, right now, 1998. To the church, John wishes you grace and peace from him who is, and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. The seven spirits, angels, principalities, the angels which were thought to govern these seven major churches. 
in Asia. See, he comes amid the clouds. Every eye shall see him, even of those who pierced him. All the peoples of the earth shall lament him bitterly. So it is to be. Amen. And then it goes on. St. John has this mystical experience. It is not so important the individual little details of it, what this little thing means, what that little thing means. The allegorical sense, remember the spiritual sense of sacred scripture. And that consists of the allegorical and the moral and the anagogical. That spiritual sense is what's very important for you and for me. Can we learn something from it? Yes, we can. We must. And then, you know, this revelation goes on to the seven churches. You're somewhat familiar with that. The Spirit's word to the churches. The Spirit, capital S, not any old spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the soul of the church. What is the soul? That is the life principle. We have a soul. The soul is the life-giving force of the body. The principle of the body. The church has a life-giving principle too. The Holy Spirit is the very life of the church. That's why the Holy Spirit is called the Lord and giver of life. And so listen to the Spirit's word to the church. That transcendent word, which although it took place historically, I believe it, St. John the Apostle, had that experience, that mystical experience, that ecstasy, wherein God revealed to him very important things. Things that are so important that they can't be mired down by the feeble bonds of mere time and space. Transcendent things, relevant for all times, all places, including right here and right now. To Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, to the angel in the Church of the United States of America in 1998, write this, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven lampstands of gold has this to say. You see that symbolic language. The seven stars are the seven presiding spirits, the seven angels. The seven lampstands are the seven churches of Asia, which the Spirit is speaking to. But don't stay there. Go above that and realize it's not only 2,000 years ago just for Asia. It's for you, the church right now, right here. And here's what he says to you to me, to the church in the United States right now. I know your deeds, your labors, and your patient endurance. Your patient endurance. How patient some of you have been. How patient in the face of very distressing things in the church. You have had the patience of a saint. You've put up with a lot. I know your deeds, deeds of sacrifice and prayer, the deeds of fidelity, keeping the faith when it wasn't easy. Oh, the Holy Spirit says, I know your deeds and your labors, and I surely know your patient endurance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked men. Can you? Church in America. Can you tolerate wicked men? I say that we tolerate them quite well in general, both outside the church and inside the church. Now St. John is talking inside the church. He is not talking outside the church. He's not talking about the rapists and the murderers and all those pagans out there. He's talking about the evil inside the church. 
I know you cannot tolerate wicked men. You have tested those self-styled apostles who are nothing of the sort and discovered that they are imposters. You'll see he talks about evil men and then self-styled apostles. Well, apostles aren't in the pagan world. Apostles are in the church. Heresies were already going on. The devil had already infiltrated the church. There was already evil and lies being taught in the name of truth. Satan had turned everything upside down already in the church, even in St. John's own lifetime. What does the devil do? Well, Jesus said he is a liar and the father of lies, a murderer from the beginning. What is a lie? The truth turned upside down. Reality topsy-turvy. What does a Satanist do? Turns everything upside down. Crucifix upside down. In a black mass, the words of the mass read backwards. Oh, it's really not a child in the womb. You can be pro-choice and Catholic. The truth turned upside down. Oh, you don't believe that Polish pope. He's old-fashioned. Birth control? What's the big deal? Sex outside of marriage? Come on, it's the 90s. On and on. What's that? That's a lie. The truth turned upside down. When you get it from the pagan world, you expect it. When you get it inside the church, ooh, it hurts. Let me tell you something. Any hell's angel out there committing rape, murder, and mayhem doesn't commit worse sins than priests, religious, and theologians inside the church teaching lies, perverting the consciences of little ones. Better that they have a millstone fastened around their neck and be cast into the sea. Why? The one out there murders the body, defiles the body. The one in here murders the soul, defiles the spirit, drags them to hell. An infinitely worse sin. And so the spirit says to the church, I know you cannot tolerate wicked men. And we had better ask ourselves if we indeed can or cannot tolerate wicked men. We have tolerated them quite well for decades. I want to explain a word to you, tolerance. I have been told even by bishops, now, Father, we must be tolerant. Amen. We must be tolerant. What is tolerance? Tolerance accepts a wide spectrum of goods. If you have Benedict in spirituality, I must tolerate that, even if it's not my thing. If you have Franciscan spirituality, that's a good. I must tolerate it, even if I don't care for it myself. If you want to go on vacation to Florida, okay, to Hawaii, fine. If you want to be a carpenter, good. If you want to be a lawyer, okay. I have to tolerate all kinds of goods. If you are white, fine. If you are black, fine. If you are yellow, okay. God created us. Equal in dignity, he created us. I must tolerate all good things. That's tolerance. Acceptance of goods, no matter how diverse they may be. There is a radical and essential difference between tolerance and permissiveness. I do not have to, nor may I tolerate evil and call it a good. Tolerance and permissiveness are two radically different things. And in the name of tolerance, we have become permissive facilitating and enabling 
evil right in our own house. And so theologians teach immoral theology and get away with it decade after decade. One sat at a chair of moral theology at a major Catholic university 23 years. 23 years! Defied church teaching. Formed generations of priests in immoral theology. Oh, artificial contraception's all right. When it's the clear teaching of the church that it isn't. And the Holy Father clarified it in Humanae Vitae. And a number of them signed the letter rejecting it. They signed their own death warrant. They rejected the faith. They excommunicated themselves in virtue of their refusal to believe what the church believes. And the Holy Father has come out with a letter very recently there is no such thing as dissent to authentic and authoritative church teaching. The operative word is assent. We give the assent of faith. We say yes to what God has revealed to us. We say yes to the teaching of the church, even if it doesn't fit in with our 90s lifestyle, especially if that lifestyle is disordered. There is no such thing as legitimate dissent to defined church teaching. Yet we seem to tolerate it, in quotation marks, quite well. And to this day, they go on teaching literal, veritable heresy in Catholic seminaries, universities, and even high school. And I have had countless Catholic parents come to me in tears saying the worst thing they ever did was send their children to a Catholic school, for they lost the faith because of it. Archbishop Fulton Sheen, in the late 70s, right before he died, said, I tell my relatives and my best friends this. If you want your children to fight for their faith, send them to public school. If you want your children to lose their faith, send them to Catholic school. Now, I didn't say that. Archbishop Fulton Sheen said it, and it's recorded for posterity on tape. One heck of a statement from an archbishop, and the most famous one of this century in this country, that's for sure, and a prophet in his own time. I've been around the religious education establishment a little bit, and there are many good and dedicated teachers, professors of theology, wonderful sisters who teach the faith faithfully, wonderful theologians, but there are an enormous number who do not. They have exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We seem to tolerate it quite well. I sat in a meeting not that long ago with a number of bishops and theologians. I sat between two bishops. The one on my left said, well, we're wasting our time in this meeting. It was on moral theology. I said, why is that, Bishop? He said, well, until we come out and publicly denounce Pope Paul VI and Humanae Vitae, we're wasting our time. Yeah, the bishop said that to my face. I didn't read it on the front page of The Wanderer. He said it. My hearing was fine. I made him repeat it three times to make sure. <laughs> the one on the right said, I don't think we can talk much about formation of conscience. You know, it's in the catechism. But, you know, we have to tell our people they have to form their conscience to the world around them. What? What do you mean by that? Well, we're not the only ones with a good idea. We have to be up to date and people of our times. I so, said, well, what do you mean that if the culture says that it's all right to commit mortal sin, we should form our conscience in accordance with that? He said, oh, mortal sin, I doubt there is such a thing. 
Now, if you would ever confront one of them with this, they'd deny it to your face. We tolerate evil men. And watch out. The consequences are about to come home to roost. False apostles teaching error, deceived in deceiving others, plausible liars, blind in leading the blind. Both are going to fall into a pit if they don't watch out. Oh, I know you can't tolerate wicked men. I hope our Lord is speaking to you and to me. You've tested those self-styled apostles who are nothing of the sort. You found that they don't really teach what the church teaches, however clever their language, however subtle their heresies. Let me tell you something, and I'm saying it straight out. There are two churches right now, the right one and the wrong one. God's church and Satan's assembly using pawns to put forth something less, much less than the true faith. Let those who have ears hear. You can't hear it. Pray that Jesus himself heal you and you can hear the truth. You are patient. You are patient and endure hardship for my cause. Jesus is speaking those consoling words to you. His long-suffering, beloved disciple. I travel all over the country from Alaska to Louisiana, Canada to Florida, every place in between, every place I have gone. The last seven years, it's the same story. A story of pain, a story of privation, a story of spiritual neglect, a story of God's little ones like sheep without a shepherd. And we say all is well. All is not well. And let the shepherds take heed. For they're on thin ice. I know you are patient. And endure hardship. Moreover, you do not become discouraged. My brothers and sisters, let me tell you the devil's number one weapon in this spiritual warfare. It is discouragement. That discouragement which leads to despondency, which leads to despair. They fall off from the left and from the right. When I was in the army in the old days, Vietnam was going on and we were learning anti-terrorist tactics. One thing we learned was you don't negotiate with a terrorist. He's dishonest. He's evil. He'll stab you in the back. You don't negotiate with terrorists. You cut their heads off. You take them out. Unless you do it our way, we won't celebrate the sacraments. Oh, yeah, that's happened. We tolerate evil men, false apostles, and we'd better wake up and get a backbone. We'd better wake up, stand fast. You know, you can't stand without a spine. If you don't have a spine, you collapse and fall. You won't stand for anything, and you'll fall for everything. We'd better get a backbone. And we'd better start demanding to be evangelized and catechized, for we have a right to be evangelized. We have a right to be catechized. It is not some kind of special privilege. It is a right which comes in virtue of your baptism. I hold this against you, however. The Spirit says to the church in Ephesus. 
you have turned aside from your early love. Have you turned aside from your early love? I worry that I have. I remember when I began, after my reconversion to the Catholic faith, having been gone 20 years, having lived in mortal sin 20 years, abandoned the Lord and his holy church for 20 years, I came back. His mercy and his grace gave me wings. I'd pray all night, fast, read the Bible all day, devour every book I could find in the faith, do penance, sacrifice myself, my early love. I look at myself now and I have to beg for mercy because I don't know where my early love has gone. Seems I've gone backwards rather than forwards. Oh, maybe the Holy Spirit's done something. Maybe I understand things better now. Maybe I'm more humble than I used to be. I hope so because I didn't used to be very humble. I came back, God gave me the Holy Spirit. He allowed me to know what's true and what's not true. I could spot an error a mile away. The problem with that is you begin to look at everybody in the church. Oh, this one's doing that. That one's doing that. Before you know it, you're the only one left who's faithful. <laughs> All the rest of them are no good. And you call it discernment. <laughs> oh, I can spot the speck in my brother's eye from a mile away. The plank in my own? Oh, I can't see that at all. And so hopefully we grow out of that. We learn. God humbles us. But I worry that my early love, not what I have now, I have to try. I have to repent every day. Keep firmly in mind the heights from which you have fallen. Repent, the Spirit says to the church. Repent and return to your former deeds. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. I will remove it from its place. But you have this much in your favor. You detest the practices of the Nicolaitans just as I do. Now, God's saying if we don't repent, he will come and remove our lampstand. Now, what is a lampstand? Well, it's a place where you put a lamp. Let your light shine before men. Don't put it under a bushel basket, Scripture says. The church is a lampstand. The church in the United States is to be a place where the light of Christ shines to the nations. We are to look to the church for moral guidance, and we have it. The church is faithful. The Holy Father has consistently been a moral force. The Catholic Church is solid in her faith, in her morality. We are a light to the nations, but individuals inside of the church who represent the church often let the light go out. It doesn't shine. Why? because they preferred the darkness rather than the light. When the church, the local church, isn't cautious and prudent to maintain that light, to hold fast to the light of Christ, which is truth and the fullness thereof, beware, lest the Master come and remove your lampstand. A priest friend of mine gave a talk not too long ago, and he said the day is coming where those of us who are faithful to our faith won't be able to show our face in the street. St. Saint Francis prophesied that a Franciscan won't be able to go out into the street at some future date because of the habit will be despised and cursed because of the actions of some of the brothers. It's already here. Be faithful to your faith and God will reward you. 
be faithful to your faith and the world will persecute you. You don't like being persecuted? I'm sorry, there isn't any other way. You can hide it and please the pagan world. You can live it and please God. And it's getting to the point where there's not going to be any in-between, no middle ground, no fence to sit on. I have to say that you have this much in your favor, though. You detest, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans. Now, what were they? Well, there's a note here in this Bible, and it says, like Balaam, the biblical prototype of religious compromisers. God is saying, he's commending the church in Ephesus, you have this much in your favor. You hate the practices of the religious compromisers, of the Christian compromisers who seek to compromise with the pagan world. I hate it too. That's what God says. And so we take our Catholic faith and we try to compromise with the pagan world. We don't want to push the business about abortion too much. Let me tell you something. If every bishop in this country, together with all of his priests, would have preached forcefully against it from the beginning, do you think it could exist with over 60 million Catholics in this country, not to mention all the good Baptists and other Christians? No way. Satan would have run. But we didn't. We were compromisers, seeking to compromise pure light with darkness. Everything ends up gray. No moral absolutes. Oh, well, it depends on the circumstances. Maybe under certain conditions. Listen, no evil can be justified. Intrinsically evil actions admit of no compromise. Taking the life of the innocent is evil, period. Do we oppose it or do we knuckle under because we're afraid of the pagan world? I hate the practices of the religious compromisers. The Spirit says to his church, then... And now, don't think that language is somehow improper for God. God doesn't hate people. God never hates his creation, least of all human beings. He loves us. But he hates what hurts us precisely because he loves us. Are you one of the contemporary religious compromisers? And then you call it pastoral. I sat in a meeting with a bunch of bishops and theologians. And I said, you know, we have to tell the truth. If somebody's in serious sin, we have to, in love, tell them, stop it. One of the contemporary sophistries says, oh, you're judging. I told you about that last night. Of course we have to make judgments. Moral judgments, rational judgments. If we refuse or fail to do that, history will record that this was an immoral and ir irrational generation, intimidated into making a moral and rational judgment because we were afraid of the admonition of Scripture, a bad translation. Condemn not your neighbor. Don't condemn him. Don't impute guilt to him. You don't know his subjective condition. But the thing in itself, it can be evil. And I have to say so. I'm not saying you're going to hell. I'm saying that thing is hurting you. Please stop it. You're hurting yourself and others. I'm not condemning the person. But I'm making a judgment in the objective order. It's either in accord with the morality or not. The failure to do this results 
in a catastrophe. Chaos ensues. Your light becomes darkness, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how deep, how very deep will the darkness be? Let him who has ears heed the Spirit's word to the churches. I will see to it that the victor eats from the tree of life which grows in the garden of God. My brothers and sisters, this is not irrelevant. Do not be misled by weak need, spineless, specious interpretations of the word of God. The meaning of this is clear for us. We cannot tolerate evil. That's permissiveness. Reject the evil. Don't reject people. Reject the sin. Don't reject the sinner. Live the truth, teach the truth, preach the truth in love. To fail to do it is indifference at best, cowardice at worst. You will stand before Almighty God. I don't care if you're 8 or 80. In one way or another, you must stand for these things. If you've been going to church every Sunday, how often have you heard this? I never heard it, except when I was a kid. Consequently, we have been lulled into a sense of false security. And the false prophets pat us on the head, thinking that they are being pastoral, all the while confirming people in sin, saying it's okay, don't worry. False prophets, it's not okay. You and I had better repent Believe in the good news, the truth which sets us free. We are a remnant, like Gideon's army, small in number, like the twelve apostles at the beginning of the church. We are called to do battle at one of the most difficult, desperate, violent times in the history of creation. To do it will be your glory. To fail to do it, your shame. I'm putting you right on the spot. You will stand before God and answer. You can let it go in one ear and out the other. Or you can accept it, take that responsibility to start living with zeal. To come before God Almighty one day and like the prophet Elijah who wasn't afraid of kings, who wasn't afraid of Jezebel, who wasn't afraid of hell, who wasn't afraid of death itself, but who fought the good fight, who took up the two-edged sword of the word of God and did battle with the devil himself. You'll be able to stand like Elijah before God and say, with zeal have I been zealous for the Lord God of hosts. My brothers and sisters, heed the Spirit's word to the church now. For the apocalypse isn't later. It is the apocalypse right here, right now, in your time and in your place. May God bless you and give you the strength to do a difficult but necessary thing. I have the greatest confidence in you. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Sometimes it's hard for me to preach this way to such good people, better than me. I know you are. But I have to do it. For me to do that is just to do what I'm called to do. For me to fail to do it is to lose my eternal soul. I have no doubt of that. And so let's Fight the good fight and stand before God and receive the reward. God's blessing. This is Father John Farrar.